Psalm 90. Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. Before the mountains were born, or you brought forth the whole world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turn people back to dust, saying, Return to dust, you mortals. A thousand years in your sight are like a day that has just gone by, or like a watch in the night. Yet you sweep people away in the sleep of death. They are like the new grass of the morning. In the morning it springs up new, but by evening it is dry and withered. We are consumed by your anger and terrified by your indignation. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. All our days pass away under your wrath. We finish our years with a moan. Our days may come to 70 years or 80 if our strength endures, yet the best of them are are but trouble and sorrow, for they quickly pass and we fly away. If only we knew the power of your anger. Your wrath is as great as the fear that is, that is your due. Teach us to number our days, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Relent, Lord, how long will it be? Have compassion on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your unfailing love, that we may sing for joy and be glad all our days. Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us, for as many years as we have seen trouble. May your deeds be shown to your servants, your splendor to their children. May the favor of the Lord our God rest on us, establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. My name's um, John T. I'm one of the pastors here. And um, if this is your first time here, um, as James said, lovely to have you with us. I hope that you have found a warm welcome. Um, Our practice is just to kind of open up books of the Bible and kind of just go through them sequentially. Every now and again, we stop just to reflect on certain big themes in the Bible, and we're doing that over the next three weeks. And I hope that whoever you are, whatever kind of background you're coming for, you've you've from the you find this useful. Um, and we'll be landing in Psalm 90, but we'll be going all over the Bible this week. So you'll need your handout. Your handout will give us a bit of an idea of where we're going, a bit of a sense of progress, and um, you can take notes if there's anything that you think is worth noting. I think as I've grown up, there have been two errors I've made when it comes to the Christian faith. Errors that I suspect many of us in this room have made in the past. Maybe many of us are still making. I wonder if either of these errors sound familiar. The first is connected to this. There was a survey done a few years ago asking people what they thought about Christians. And the result was interesting. 19% of people thought that Christians were authentic. Uh, 32% that we were generous. 19% 19% encouraging, 23 hopeful, 33 good humoured, interesting, 50% caring, 62% friendly. I think the error that many people make is that Christians are good people. And that's not the, that's not the error. Christians are good people. But they think that the heart of Christianity is about being good people, doing good things for God. That's the key. So there's God in heaven looking around for someone who actually wants to do the right thing. Somebody who wants to hang out with him, somebody who wants to come to buildings like this and sing on Sunday evenings, wants to pray. And Christians will say, uh, people who say, go on then, I'll do that, I'll do that. And God, he's just chuffed. Chuffed that at last someone wants to do what he wants them to do. Fantastic. First big error, I used to think Christians were essentially good people who do things for God. Second is that the Christian life It's all about giving God a slice of the pie. What do I mean by that? Modern life's busy for many. Many of us are busy keeping on top of work and maybe doing a bit of occasional cleaning and shopping and emails and bills and plans and projects. And we fill out time trying to be healthy and trying to be informed and whether that's sport or hobby or interest or whatever. All whilst we know that Quantity time is quality time, and so we're trying to hang out with our hallmates and flatmates and course mates and friends and family and spouse and kids and grandkids. So we're busy. 
And if you know any Christians, you might have observed that they're particularly busy at church on Sunday, at that other meeting or on that other day. Christians seem to love meetings. And on top of that, there's private prayer, Bible reading, book reading, prep for some of those meetings. They just seem so busy. And so it's easy to think that becoming a Christian, well, it's about getting busy, getting stuck in, doing good, giving God a piece of the pie of my life. And as I've thought about it over the years, I've realized that that isn't right. It's a right observation. Christians are generally good and just Christians are generally busy, but it's the wrong conclusion. Don't know how your mind works. This helps me <coughs> by analogy. Just as everything that quacks is not a duck, or everything that does calculations isn't a computer, being good, doing good, doing stuff for God doesn't make you a Christian, even though that's what Christians do. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? You're with me. Okay, not just me. It's the question, what is a Christian? What is a Christian? How would you end that sentence? If someone asked you, what is a Christian? You've got 30 seconds to answer them. Don't, don't do it now, but how would you answer that sentence? What is a Christian? I think a basic answer, a Christian is someone whose life has been turned upside down by the person of Jesus. Isn't that a reasonable answer? Someone whose life has been turned upside down by the person of Jesus. Somebody who's discovered who he is, God incarnate, extraordinary thought, God in the flesh. Someone who's worked out what he came to do, live the perfect life, die a sin-bearing death, that humanity might have a fresh start, a renewed relationship with the God who made the universe. A Christian is someone who's worked out what he promises us, that anyone who puts their life in his hand, anyone who knows him as their saviour and their master has forgiveness and peace in this life and has the prospect of joy and unending, sat unending satisfaction in the life to come. A Christian is someone who knows Jesus and because they know who he is and what he's done and what he's promised, their life has been turned upside down. And say, so, look, a, the Christian life isn't about what we do for God. God in his son has done more for us than we would ever even start to think about doing for him. Look, a Christian isn't someone who gives Jesus a piece of the pie or even a, a really big piece of the pie. A Christian is someone who realizes that the whole pie belongs to God. Every last bit should be his. Your work and your studies, your family and your relationships, your money and your resources, your nine to five and your five to nine, your weekdays and your weekends, if he is who he says he is, he's Lord of it all and has things to say about it all, and all that he says about it is good news. I wonder if you've ever realized that. I wonder if you've forgotten that. I think it's massively important, particularly when you're going to do something like we're going to do in the next few weeks, where we think about these basic areas of life and ask the question, what does a life that please, that pleases God, that honors him, what does it look like? We need to be clear, this is not about us just giving God a piece of the pie. He owns the whole pie. It's not about us being good for him. He's done more for us than we'll ever do for him. But it's still a good question to ask, what does it look like to be a Christian and to live out for, for our Christian identity to flow out into these areas? What does it look like for a duck to quack, if we're going to go back to my weird analogy? And if you're not a Christian, look, this is just a great opportunity for you to learn, for you to observe, to consider what life could, would look like if you embraced Jesus for yourself. We think about three areas. Tonight we think about time, how we spend our time. Next week we think about how we spend our talents and our gifts. Week after we think about work and study. There'll be some interaction between the three weeks. Hopefully some of it's old news, hopefully some of it's good news, but I hope it gives us a fresh focus and joy as we think about what it means to live for him. So let me pray, then we'll dive in. Let me pray. Father, thank you for Jesus. Thank you that he is your son incarnate. Thank you that he died that we might know you. Thank you that he promises us the world if we would follow him. 
And Father, help us to do that more loyally, more closely, more authentically as we think about this idea of time and how we use our time. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're hurtling towards uh, a Q&A. Time for you to ask me any question. Um, and before we do that, I'm going to give you three biblical facts about time, then four non-negotiables about how we spend our time. Three biblical facts about time. First is this, our time is God-given. The Bible says that God is not the watchmaker who winds up the watch of this earth and then puts his feet up and lets it run and run and run. Acts 17, 26 says this, from one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth and he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. All the nations, every single one, have been marked out by him. The Roman Empire, the British Empire, the 70 year reign of Queen Elizabeth, the, the 50 day tenure of Elizabeth Truss, all of it was marked out and planned out by God. Our time is in his hands on a macro level, at a kind of geopolitical level but also on a very personal level. Listen to James chapter 4. Now listen, you say today or tomorrow, we will go to this city, this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Why, you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it's God, if it's Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. And as it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes. All such boasting is evil. Question. What are you going to be doing tomorrow? Maybe stay, tomorrow's a day off. Day in the office. Day with the kids, whatever. James says, be very careful how you talk about it and how you think about it. Because actually you have no idea whether it will actually happen. If it's the Lord's will, it might happen. It might not. Our time is in his hands. Our breath is in his hands. It is arrogance to think otherwise. Our time is God-given, the Bible says. Second, our time is very short. The time that God gives us isn't very long at all. Listen to Ethan the Ezraite speaking of God in the psalm. Psalm 89. Remember how fleeting is my life. For what futility you have created all humanity. Who can live and not see death? Who can escape the power of the grave? Or James 4 as we just read. What is your life? You're a mist that appears for a little while then vanishes. Our interactions and our decisions and our lives, they feel so weighty because they are. They do matter. They really do. Our lives are significant in so many ways, but they're not long. Probably not healthy to think about it all the time, but it's probably not very healthy to never think about it. One day, you will be gone. One day, you will be gone. Our lives come, and they go, like the morning mist on a crisp spring's day. Our life is very short. And when you put that together with our first fact, it seems pretty obvious that point number three, our time is very precious. It's God-given, very short, and therefore it's very precious indeed. Now, I'm a bit nervous about sharing this fact, but I'm going to share it. The average person will live for 81 years. I'm nervous about that because some of us are closer to 81 than others. <laughs> but, but it's only an average. Um, that's 42 million minutes. That's 709,000 hours. That's 29,000 plus days. And it sounds like a lot. But ask anyone older than you, and they will tell you that time flies. And it seems to speed up. And it can be terrifying. Hopefully that's quite sobering. Because as one ancient philosopher said, time is the most valuable thing that a person can spend. And I think he's right. 
uh, a kind of um, efficiency kind of guru said this recently, I think he's right as well. Lost wealth can be replaced by industry, lost knowledge by study, lost health by temperance or medicine, but lost time is gone forever. I will never be 21 again. And don't I know it? Psalm 39, verse 16, all the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. God knows exactly how many days I will have on this earth. I will have not one less and not one more. And the Bible's perspective is that every single one is a gift from him. So precious. And so tonight, for the rest of our time, I want to give you a challenge. I've called it the 29K challenge. You only have, on average, 29 plus K days. And for some of us, lots of that's ahead of us. For some of us, most of that's behind us. I'm at the halfway mark, almost exactly, 41 and a, um, 40 and a half. And there's all sorts you could do with those 29 K days. All sorts that you should do. But tonight, my case is this. If you're a Christian, there are at least four things which are just essential, four non-negotiables. Yes, this is a simplification of what your life should be like, but hopefully it's not an oversimplification. Wherever you go, whatever life throws at you, whatever situation you find yourself in, will you commit yourself to these four tasks, whatever happens? And my case is this, that if you do, that is the essence of a life lived well. If you don't, that's the essence of a life not lived well. Four commitments, and then we'll have questions. First is this, don't waste a chance to live for God. 1 Peter chapter 4. Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves with the same attitude, because whoever suffers in the body is done with sin. As a result, they do not live the rest of their earthly lives of human desires, but rather the will of God. For you've spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, crowning, and detestable idolatry. I don't think I've ever heard someone use the word or the phrase kind of yellow, um, as in you only live once. But I've certainly kind of seen the sentiment. I was tired of my job and so, do you know what, I just, I just quit YOLO. Or I'm only going to do uni once, and so I'm just going to go for it. I'm just going to have a great time, just forget about the consequences. Or I don't know if she likes me. I'm just going to ask her that anyway. You only live once. Uh, that's my friend. I've got a friend who's just very aware of the fact that he's not getting younger. And so he's going on a massive holiday in a few days' time. Because he's just thinking, I only live once. Do what you want, when you want, how you want. Why not? You only live once. And Peter's logic is almost exactly diametrically opposed to that. It's almost the reverse. Verse 2, Christians are those who, like their master Jesus, do not live their earthly lives for human desires, but rather the will of God. And do you see why? Verse 3, They've got this sense that they've already wasted enough time doing what pagans choose to do. Life's too short. They don't want to waste any more time living for themselves. Living like those who don't know God. Their earthly lives, as you put it in verse 2, aren't long. So they don't want to waste any more time. I this all time speaking to people who've become Christians later on in life. Or maybe started to take Christian things a bit more seriously later on in life. Here at time after time, I feel like I've wasted so much time. And in a way, you want to console them, don't you? Um, well, at, at least you know Christ now. And actually, God will use some of those experiences. And there's other things that you can say, but in a way, they're right, though, aren't they? In a way, they are right. They have wasted so much time, so much time they could have been living for God, doing things for God, knowing God. I think one mark of someone who understands Jesus and what he's done for them is this increasing sense that life is just too short. It's too short to get drunk or to sleep around or spend time on online gambling or to go to party after party after party. Life is just too short. I guess for many in the room, the issue is a bit more subtle. 
nurturing greed, ogling pin interest. Oh, sorry, pin interest. Pinterest, as it's called to others. Pin interest is something different. Um, <laughs> ogling Pinterest. Ogling Zoopla. Ogling Booking.com or whatever it might be. Selfishness, self-centeredness, nurturing greed. I had a friend at uni who was obsessed with cars. He spent all his time looking at car magazines. Eventually he said, no, that's not helpful for me. That's not a good use of my time and my mind. Life is too short. And he was right. Life is too short to nurture lust, looking at explicit images or even not explicit images that probably still aren't helpful. Life's too short to listen to that music, read that magazine, play that computer game that just doesn't help you. I've set my Spotify setting. I didn't realize I could do this until recently. I've set my, I've set my Spotify setting to not play explicit content. I struggle with swearing myself, but some limit lyrics just aren't help me. Life is too short. It's too short to be nurturing envy and bitterness and self-pity that comes from doom scrolling on your friend's Instagram page. Life is too short to nurture anger. We could go on and on. Life is too short to live for self. There are zero people who on their deathbed say, I wish I spent more time nurturing bitterness. I wish I spent more time drinking. If sin is anti-God, then by definition it's anti-all that is good. It's a waste of your time. Peter says, are you done with sin? Second, don't waste your chance to speak for God. I'm just reading from the English Standard Version because it highlights the use of time aspects, um, which is there in the original language. So Colossians 4 Colossians 4 verse 2, continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us, that God may open for us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on the account of which I'm in prison. That I may make it clear, which is how I ought to speak, walk in wisdom towards outsiders, making best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. What's the best use of your time with those who are outsiders? Outsiders sounds a bit weird, doesn't it? It just means friends and family who don't know Jesus. Of course, if you love them and you love Jesus, it's pretty obvious that you'd want them to have what you have and to know what you know. Paul just assumes that this will be the case. He assumes that, well, he assumes a number of things here. He assumes that some people are outsiders. There are some people who know Christ and some people who don't. Seems that Christians will know those outsiders. Christians don't just kind of hold hold themselves up in the kind of holy hub huddle. It seems that, that we would be speaking to them about Jesus. And we might not know all the answers, but um the word translated speech is the same word which is translated earlier as, as message. She's assuming that uh, given how short life is and given how short everyone else's life is and given that our greatest need is to be forgiven, this assumes that we'll be trying to say something to them about Jesus and about the forgiveness that can be found in him. I think even those who aren't Christians can understand why people who are Christians want to share their faith with people who aren't Christians. It just makes sense. If we believe what we believe, surely, surely we want to spread it to others. And Paul, interestingly here, says that as we do, we should do it with wisdom and grace and saltiness and knowledge. Look, it's like saying something, just something about Jesus is better than saying nothing. Well, so Paul says, don't you want to help people engage? Don't you, don't you want to be salty? Don't you want to be kind of tasty to people, in, in, incite their kind of intrigue, their curiosity, raise their curiosity. Just think about how you do this. I guess you can do that by asking questions. Just ask people questions about what they think, what they believe, how they approach life. I often do this by assuming ignorance. I find that so many people don't understand what Christianity is really, really about. Do you think you know what Christianity is really about? So many people don't know. I think we can do that by personal testimony. One of the things I love about being a Christian is X, Y, Z. Life is short, particularly short when you contrast it with eternity. 
eternity, and it's almost ridiculous, eternity is long. Heaven is real. Hell is real. The hope found in Jesus is real. And so whether at school or work or uni or at the school gate or in the changing room or the retirement home or where, wherever you are, wherever you find yourself, is there a better thing to be giving your time to and your thought to and your energies to than just sharing that with people? Is there anyone on their deathbed who said, I told too many people? 29,000 days. What are you going to do? Thirdly, don't waste the chance to sing for God. Ephesians chapter 5, Paul says this, Look carefully how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. Make the best use of the time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that's debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and make mel making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always um, and for everything to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. The New Testament doesn't speak about singing much, but when it does, it makes a big deal of it. And again, here we're told how to make the best use of our time. The heart of that is not getting drunk, verse 18, but instead being under the control of the Holy Spirit. And the heart of that, verse 19, is singing. Joyful, thankful, melodious, heartfelt singing. Why? Because I think this is one of the primary ways in the new early church that you could encourage your brothers and sisters in their walk with Christ. A Bible geek said this, um, a Bible scholar, I should be more circle. Um, he said this, through these songs, members of the community who are, um, through these songs, mem members of the community who are continually filled by the Spirit will instruct, edify, and exhort one another. Guess back then, this was the easiest way to do it. Before people had Bibles and YouTube sermons and books, hymns, well, anyone could know a hymn. You didn't have to be literate, you didn't have to be te intelligent. Anyone could remember a hymn and share a hymn and sing a hymn. And so Paul's saying in a, life, in, in a life where life is short and the days are evil and the temptations away from Christ are real, we need to encourage each other. We need each other. You need to support each other and urge each other and spur each other on. I say so the challenge is wherever you go, whatever else is going on, never neglect meeting together to sing and to pray and to encourage each other. The thing is that I need you and you need me. It's so easy for church to slip off the radar. So many other things look more fun, more rewarding, more urgent. But the Christian life isn't a solo sport. It's like tennis. You, you, you can't play it by yourself. You can't do it solo. So there are three lifelong priorities. Two quick questions, then I'll give you the fourth one, and then it's over to your questions. First question that you might be asking, what about rest, John T? This all sounds a bit active. What about rest? I think that we should rest is pretty obvious. Your body forces you to do it about once every 24 hours. Sleep is good. Holidays are good. The Sabbath is good, as in the principle of taking one in seven that you find in the Old Testament law. It's no longer law for Christians, but it is wise. It is good. You can ask me about that in Q&A if you want. There is more to life than activity. Now, I think it's possible to over-spiritualize what the Sabbath was about, as if it was like a whole day at church. It wasn't a whole day at church. If you read about it in Exodus or Leviticus or Deuteronomy, the heart of it was stopping working, that you might rest. We'll think about this more when we talk about work in the third week. Some of us need to be told that. Some of us need to be told to stop. Stop pretending you're superhuman. Stop pretending there's 26 hours in a day. Stop trying to please everyone or prove yourself. Stop allowing others to dictate your, um, your schedule and your, your workload. Some of us are too busy guess one way of knowing whether you're too busy is whether you no longer have time or energy for those other things. 
fighting sin, reaching out, being in, being in church, being connected in church. But it's also worth saying there's nothing wrong with being busy. Being busy is a great thing. We were made to work. We were made to serve. Ecclesiastes 9, sorry, it's not up on the, on the screen. Ecclesiastes 9, 10 says this. Whatever your f- hand finds to do, do it with all your might. For in the realm of the dead where you're going, there is neither working nor planning, no, n- nor knowledge, nor wisdom. Again, life is short, so go for it. But, um, Ecclesiastes says, nothing wrong with being busy. The question is, what are you giving yourself to? Second question some will ask. Well, John, what about hobbies? We live in the world of two-day weekends, European work time directives. We have lives and work and routines, which mean that we have time and energy to enjoy, well, what's your thing? Reading, gardening, hiking, photography, painting, music, exercise, travel, gaming. Well, praise God, this is a good gift from him to you for your enjoyment and your relaxation. And to some, I want to say, get out there. Enjoy it. Variety is the spice of life. And some of us are stuck in the rut. Why not try something new? Maybe salsa dancing is your thing. Go for it, Connor. I'm just looking at you, Connor, for some reason. Go for it, Connor. Go for it. And actually, for some, it's a great way to fight sin. I think it's right. The devil makes work for idle hands. Maybe just sitting at home. Get out. Do something. For some, actually, it's a great way to connect with people who aren't Christians. For some, it's a great way to connect with those of us um, who are Christians. But know this. Um, just last week, I was in the room just over there um, talking with people getting baptized on the 17th. Very exciting. Got seven people getting baptized on the 17th. Interesting. Two of them had contact with Christian things at an early age but walked away from church or were pulled away from church by sports. Beware. Think of a conversation I had with friends recently and and life is hard and they were talking about what their priorities are because life is hard. Can they exercise? They said, and I thought, oh, great. Can they exercise? That's good. Clears the the head. Conversation went on. How's church going? Actually, we've, we've stopped going. It just doesn't quite work for us. We're there, we're there kind of occasionally, but it's just no longer, no longer that important for us. Beware for yourself. Beware for others. How, how does that happen? How are you going to ensure that it's not you? Life is short. Christian life is hard. We need each other. Finally, and fourthly, don't waste the chance to thank God. We're just going to end uh, by me reading a little bit of Psalm 90. Psalm 90 is wonderful. And the climax of it is, is verse 12. Um, let me just go from verse 9, which is the next slide, actually. If we go from the next slide. Verse 9, um, Moses says this, All our days pass away under your wrath. We finish our years with a moan. Our days come to 70 years or 80 if our strength endures. Yet the best of them are but trouble and sorrow, for they quickly pass. Again, that note, life is short, and we fly away. If only we knew the power of your anger, your wrath is as great as the fear that is your due. Here's the climax. Teach us to number our days, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Final thought before questions. Given how short life is, we've got to nurture a reflex of just thankfulness. Never forget that all that we have, all that we are, all that we look forward to in Christ is because of God. And so give thanks. It's just a good reflex to look back and think about the good things that you have in your life that you can give thanks for and the things that you can look forward to because of Christ that you can give thanks for. And as you do, um, Moses says, ask for a heart of wisdom. A heart that will see just how precious life is, how short life is. A heart that will be thirsty for God, thirsty to reach out for God, thirsty to be a part of a community who knows God. Here's the thing, it seems so mundane, doesn't it? These 
things, kind of being godly and reaching out and uh, being stuck in the church, being thankful. At times it can seem hard. At times it can feel like a wasted life. But when stood before God, and when stood on the edge of eternity, it will be very clear to all of us that this is the only life that makes sense. This is the only wise life.